Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things nuclear from a different perspective. My name is Libby Halevi. I am the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when those nuclear so-called experts get it wrong. This week, an encore presentation of one of Nuclear Hot Seat's most powerful and important interviews, just in time for the fifth anniversary of Fukushima. Dr. Alex Rosen is a German pediatrician and board member of the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War. On behalf of IPPNW, he presents that group's response to the United Nations UNSCIR report on Fukushima that so drastically, perhaps criminally, downplayed the health dangers of that ongoing nuclear disaster. It's an important eye-opener, just in time to inform your online comments on all the pro-nuclear garbage PR propaganda articles that will be coming out in the next two weeks. Plus, we have our popular Numbnuts of the Week feature, activist shout-outs, and more honest nuclear information than Chris Rock or anyone in Hollywood mentioned during the Oscars, regardless of their clothing choices. All of this coming up in just a few moments. Today is Tuesday, March 1st, 2016, and here's the week's nuclear news from our perspective. In Japan, a reactor at the Takahama nuclear power plant in the central part of that country has shut down automatically due to a malfunction only three days after it was restarted. This same reactor also had trouble on February 20th when cooling water containing radioactive materials leaked at a building next to the number 4 reactor, reportedly because a bolt in a pipe valve was insufficiently tightened. What other details have they missed? Ironically, nuclear industry PR had just been touting the fact that these reactors were the first in the country to be okayed for a restart beyond their 40-year limit, a limit set by the engineers who first created these reactors who knew that the containment vessels would become embrittled by the constant bombardment of the nuclear reaction and thus would not be safe and reliable beyond 40 years. Tokyo Electric Power Company has finally admitted that it should have declared meltdowns at the Fukushima facility much earlier. It only took them five years to admit that they should have been faster. Do you see a pattern here? TEPCO has admitted that its staff failed to follow damage assessment guidelines, according to which they should have reported the meltdown almost immediately. A lot of good that does us now. And now... Nuclear Hot Seat Nuclear hot seed, nuclear hot seed, none that's out of week. Tokyo Electric Power Company, TEPCO, has started to incinerate thousands of boxes of radioactively contaminated waste consisting of protective suits, gloves, socks, and other work clothes worn by plant workers that became contaminated with radiation. As of the end of last year, there were over 66 thousand one cubic meter special boxes. The incinerator can burn a maximum of 14 tons of items per day when it is operated to capacity for 24 hours, which no doubt it will be. However, we've heard nothing about testing for radioactivity released into the air. Apparently none is planned, or if it is, we're not going to hear about it. One listener familiar with the issue wrote, there is an assumption of safety in terms of releases, but what is actually released is very fine particulate matter, absolutely the worst kind of radioactive material, because if it is inhaled, it is the least likely to be expelled from the lungs. If it lodges in the body, it is no longer low-level waste. It is a high level of radiation directed at the small number of surrounding cells, and the likelihood of cancer or harm of any kind is far greater. So what is TEPCO doing about it? The day after the incineration of the protective clothing began, they made the announcement that it's now going to allow the workers not to wear protective clothing at the Fukushima facility, letting them go full Monty, radiologically speaking, of course. 
it certainly will hold down the amount of radioactive waste that they're going to have to incinerate. So isn't that clever? No. And that's why TEPCO, brain-dead, tone-deaf TEPCO, is once again this week's Nuclear Hot Seed, none that sound a week. In London, thousands of protesters assembled last Saturday, February 27, for Britain's largest anti-nuclear weapons rally in a generation. They gathered in Trafalgar Square to protest the multi-billion pound Trident nuclear weapons system. Among the day's speakers, the Labour Party leader Jeremy Corbyn and actress Vanessa Redgrave. It's all well and good that Germany committed itself five years ago to phasing out nuclear power by 2022. But there was one big gap in their plans, nuclear's dirty little secret. What to do, what to do with the waste, the radioactive waste that can remain toxic for hundreds of thousands of years. Oops! For now, they're attempting to ship some of it back to the United States under the old Atoms for Peace program, and the U.S. is trying desperately to turn it around and ship it right back to Germany, just like the German transatlantic liner St. Louis back in World War II. Nobody wanted that cargo either. In Taiwan, nuclear power experts warned that country against adopting dry cask storage for high-level radioactive waste from its nuclear power plants. Masakao Sawai from the Japan-based Citizens Nuclear Information Center said dry cask storage does not allow regular monitoring of the nuclear waste stored in welded cylinders that are in turn surrounded by concrete structures. The waste cannot be retrieved from such structures, and when it has to be opened, workers could be exposed to radiation, she said. For more on dry cask problems, check out sananofresafety.org. And when the World Nuclear Association puts out a call for proposals for their symposium, what are they focused on? Uranium prices, investment trends, the current state of the market, the share of the market. And the only stated concern for safety topics is the public perception. In the United States, in Kentucky, after learning in January that low-level nuclear waste from drilling operations, a.k.a. fracking, had been dumped illegally in Kentucky last year, state officials are warning this week that all landfills be on the lookout and to not accept any of the radioactive material. What is being labeled low-level nuclear waste from drilling operations in Ohio, Pennsylvania, and West Virginia were sent illegally to landfills in two counties within 120 miles of Louisville, in Estill County and the ironically named Greenup County. Actually, since the Westlake landfill revealed how much radioactivity was buried in North St. Louis, Every landfill in the country needs to be checked to see if radioactive material has been hidden there. And Hillary Clinton's vision for modernizing North American energy infrastructure includes increased research and development in advanced nuclear and challenge grants awarded through Clinton's Clean Energy Challenge to state, cities, and rural communities includes matching amounts of money for nuclear power. And lots of links up on the website this week to additional stories. We'll have this week's featured interview coming up in just a moment. But first, Nuclear Hot Seat is listener-supported and relies on your donations to help keep us going and growing. Now, I want to thank you for recent contributions, which went to support my trip to St. Louis, where I covered the Westlake Landfill, Coldwater Creek nuclear contamination issues, and the Adams Next Door Symposium with Dr. Helen Caldicott and Bob Alvarez. You can hear the resulting report as last week's full-length special episode, number 224. My gratitude to all of you who helped make this trip possible. But donations are always needed to support the monthly running of the show. Anything received above our monthly costs will go into long-term planning and into a travel fund. That has the goal of getting me to the Excellence in Journalism Conference this September, where I will have direct access to over 1,000 reporters, news directors, news services, and producers. Four days lobbying for honest nuclear coverage that includes our perspective. Mm -mm -mm. 
So whatever you can do to help us meet these goals, please help. Go to NuclearHotSeat.com, click on the big red donate button, and know that whatever amount you can offer is deeply appreciated. It all counts. And always, you have my gratitude. In April of 2014, the United Nations Scientific Committee on the Effects of Atomic Radiation, or UNSCIR, published a report on Fukushima that seriously, some would say criminally, understated the health dangers caused by that ongoing nuclear disaster. Three months after that, in July of 2014, the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War, IPPNW, published a report that powerfully refutes the findings of UNSCIR. Dr. Alex Rosen is a German pediatrician who serves as Vice President of International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War from his home in Berlin, Germany. He's also a former Vice Chair of the International IPPNW Board of Directors. In this interview, he uses his organization's recently published critical analysis of the UNSCIR report to decode the UN agency's methodology and, in effect, demolish its credibility. This is an encore presentation from Nuclear Hot Seat number 161, originally aired on July 22nd of 2014. Alex Rosen, welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat. Hello. Greetings from Berlin. What is the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War, or IPPNW, and what is your position in regard to it? IPPNW is an international NGO founded in 1980 by a Soviet and an American cardiologist who had the crazy notion to not just save their patients, but the whole world by making everyone understand the true dangers behind nuclear weapons. They managed to get the leaders of their two countries down to negotiate arms reduction and received the Nobel Peace Prize in 1985. IPPNW has been around since the 1980s and has expanded its mission not just to work against nuclear weapons, but also against all parts of the nuclear chain. That is the uranium mining, the civil use of nuclear energy, the military use um, of nuclear weapons, all the way to the problem of nuclear waste. My position in IPPNW is that I am currently the vice chair of the German affiliate. We have more than 60 affiliates around the world, and the German one, which has its head office here in Berlin, has about 7,000 members, and we have a board that I am a member of. What is the IPPNW's previous relationship or stance as regards UNSCIR? UNSCIR, the United Nations Scientific Committee on the Effects of Atomic Radiation, has been widely criticized, not just by IPPNW, but by doctors and scientists around the world for its stance on uh, nuclear energy, especially regarding the um, accident or the catastrophe in, in Chernobyl. And this is a history or the story that we see repeating itself now again in Fukushima, that UNSCARE is issuing statements and press releases that we feel are not very representative of what is really going on on the ground. So IPPNW Germany has been criticizing UNSCARE ever since Chernobyl for its stance on promoting uh, or whitewashing nuclear catastrophes. And right now we are working together with more than a dozen other IPPNW affiliates around the world, including the U.S. affiliate, on actually making known and making making public what UNSCARE is, is saying and uh, where their report about the Fukushima disaster is wrong. IPPNW has issued a critique, an annotated critique, of the UNSCIR report on Fukushima. Before we get into the specifics of it, how was this put together? Well, we are an international organization, so we have people all over the world working on this topic. And mainly the U.S. and the German affiliate have been uh, working on, on this topic of the UNSCARE report, meeting regularly on Skype calls, um, sending each other documents, exchanging views, and getting expertise from all over the world, from India, from the U.K., from Australia, from Austria and Switzerland, from some of our African affiliates, like in Nigeria, Scientists and doctors all across the world bringing together their expertise on the health effects of ionizing radiation in order to really take a critical look at UNSCARE's findings and make public what we feel is, is wrong or is missing. 
there are 10 specific conclusions that were reached by this critical analysis as regards the UNSCIR report. Let's go through them individually so you can explain to us the exact factors that led to the conclusions and the criticisms that you have about the report. The first is that the validity of UNSCIR's source term estimates is in doubt. Yes. Um, when we looked at UNSCIR's report, the most obvious question that we had, first of all, is which facts do they base their calculations of the health effects in Fukushima on? And one of the most important parameters when you look at um, radioactive contamination is, of course, how many radionuclides, how much radioactivity was released by the accident. And there are several calculations or estimations that are circulating internationally by different organizations, and they give different numbers on the size or the magnitude of radioactive emissions. And what UNSCARE does is it doesn't take the most neutral source. It doesn't take a median between the highest and the lowest estimation. It doesn't take a source that you could argue this would be the most uh, most believable. They take the Japanese Atomic Energy Association scientist who's estimation on the amount of, of radioactive emissions is lower by a few factors than the estimations by neutral sources like the Norwegian Institute for Air Research or the Austrian Central Meteorologic Institute. So just to give one example, UNSCAR says that the emission of cesium-137, so that's a very particular radionuclide that's important to know when you talk about radioactive contamination, was 9 peta becquerel. And so that's nine quadrillion becquerel, uh, whereas the independent Norwegian Institute for Air Research, they found 37 peta becquerels, more than four times that number. And now we're not saying that the Norwegians are completely right and the Japanese Atomic Energy Association is completely wrong. All we're saying is if there's different numbers, you have to closely look at who is publishing these numbers, with which interest, how valid are their calculations, and does it really make sense to take the lowest possible numbers, which come from the Japanese Atomic Energy Association directly, an organization that is being heavily criticized by the Japanese parliament, in fact, for being co-responsible for the nuclear disaster in Fukushima. And if you take their numbers, their low estimates, then obviously your calculations that you do with these numbers will have a systematic underestimation of the health effects in the end. There are serious concerns regarding the calculations of internal radiation. Yes, that's the next issue that we are dealing with in our report or our critique of the UNSCAR report, the concerns regarding the calculations of internal radiation. So the next parameter after looking at the emissions, the magnitude of the emissions, is you want to see how much of this radioactivity was actually incorporated by people. And it, with incorporated, I mean inhaled in terms of radioactive dust floating in the atmosphere or ingested with food or drink. So it's very important to look at the radioactive contamination of food and drink in, in Japan, especially in the affected uh, region in northeastern Honshu Island, and to look at how much of this radioactivity would actually be ingested by people or inhaled. And in order to do that, you need to have food samples, first of all. You need to go on the fields and in the markets and actually take samples in order to calculate or estimate how much radioactivity is in everyone's food. And you need to make assumptions on the amount of food people eat, the origin of their food. And what UNSCARE does is, first of all, they base their entire calculations on internal radiation on one single source. And now this source could be an independent scientific uh, committee or an organization that has done independent testing. But instead, what UNSCARE does is they take as the single source of their calculation of internal radiation the International Atomic Energy Agency, the IAEA. And we all know that the IAEA was founded in order to promote civil nuclear energy. So they don't have a very big interest in actually showing a lot of negative effects of the Fukushima nuclear disaster. In fact, you could say they're very biased and they're not the best source to base calculations of internal radiation on. But this is what UNSCARE does. They take the IAEA food database as the single source of their calculations. And um, nowhere in the document, in the UNSCARE report, does it say 
how these samples were taken, who took them, where they were taken, when they were taken. It just refers to a spreadsheet, the food database, which never appears in the document and which is supposed to be published at a later point in a sort of addendum, but which still isn't available to researchers and independent uh, scientists like us wanting to see where this data actually comes from. So there's no way to check or to control how valid these food samples were. What we do know is that the IAEA database, of which certain parts have been published by the WHO, shows maximum levels of, of radioactive contamination, which are much lower than even the Japanese government's numbers. So we're very worried that by taking this database as a single source, you're actually underestimating the effects of internal radiation and adding to that the assumptions that UNSCARE bases its calculations on, assumptions on the amount of food that people eat from the affected region, the amount of checks and, uh, and controls that are taking place in Fukushima, these assumptions are just, are just wrong. They're not based on reality, and they draw a picture that is much too optimistic in our view. Another issue that was raised by the critique of Unskir's report is that the dose assessments of the Fukushima workers cannot be relied upon. Yes, this is uh, another point where, again, we're talking about uh, which sources you base your calculations on. If you're looking at the group of Fukushima workers, um, you would think that you would take independent uh, research data on these people in order to calculate their health effects. But instead, UNSCARE bases its numbers solely on the numbers that it gets from TEPCO. Now, TEPCO is the company that ran Fukushima before it went bankrupt over the catastrophe. It's a company that owns several nuclear power plants in Japan that made millions, if not billions of dollars with nuclear energy, and which obviously does not have an interest in making this catastrophe look worse than it is. And um, instead, what we see is that they don't just hire people themselves, but what they do oftentimes is they hire subcontractors. And these subcontractors hire other subcontractors. So in the end, the people actually doing the dirty work in and for TEPCO are people that are so far away from TEPCO's rules and regulations that it's very difficult to actually make sure that these people adhere to the safety standards, that these people's exposition to radioactive contamination is actually properly measured. There have been reports of missing dosimeters. There have been reports of uh, lead coverings on the dosimeters in order to manipulate the readings. There have been reports of mafia connections in the group of subcontractors. So there's a lot of shady deals and corruption going on on these levels. And taking the numbers of TEPCO as the sole source to calculate health effects of the workers without any independent data available, nothing from the government, nothing from independent researchers, just TEPCO's own data, again leads to systematic underestimation of the health effects. Another conclusion that was reached by the report is that the UNSCARE report ignores the effects of fallout on the non-human biota. Yes, what that means is that we're not just talking about humans, obviously, we're talking about plants, we're talking about animals. And what we've learned from Chernobyl is that, especially in the animal population, you are much better able to demonstrate health effects and transgenerational effects, not just on the animals that were alive and present at the time of the disaster, but their offspring generations down the line. And obviously with butterflies or mice, you have much better chances at researching these transgenerational effects than, than you do in a, in a human population where obviously people are not guinea pigs. So um, what scientists have been doing, and uh, there's a very active U.S. group around, Tim Mousseau, who's a, a scientist who's been traveling to Chernobyl, for many years catching birds and looking at, at different types of animals and their health effects in regards to, to the radioactive contamination. And they've been able to find several very meaningful health effects concerning fertility, concerning mutations. And all of this knowledge is out there. It's, it's published in peer-reviewed journals. It's there and you can research it on the internet, but it doesn't appear in the Unscare report. What the Unscare report says is that there's no real data on the non-human biota, and therefore they did not take it into consideration. And this is something that we are criticizing, obviously, because 
you can't say because something happens to butterfly, it will also happen to humans. But at least, and this is what we know from pharmacological studies and other, other health studies, you can deduce something from it. And you can say, well, if this happens in all types of mammals, why shouldn't it happen in human beings? And especially the transgenerational effects, which are so difficult to demonstrate in, in a human population, can be demonstrated can be seen, can be proven in animal populations. And that's at least food for thought. It's at least something that should be considered. And you, you should say, well, we see this effect in animals. We see this effect in plants. We expect a similar effect in human beings. How large it is, we don't know at this point, but at least it's ground enough for further research. But this is not happening. And this is our criticism. And what we're doing in, in our paper is basically listing some of the findings of Tim Oso and his group and asking Unscare to include it in, in, in future, future publications. The next issue that was raised by the critique was the special vulnerability of the embryo to radiation and that it was not taken into account. Yeah, this is an issue that's very important to me as a pediatrician. Human beings don't react to radioactivity the same way. Radioactivity has stochastic effects. That means that it's not about determining a certain dose or a certain amount of radioactivity that is harmful and everything below that is, is safe. It's not like that. It's actually similar to when you're talking about smoking. You can't say two cigarettes is fine and three cigarettes will kill you. It's all about chances that you take. And the more you smoke or the more contact you have to radioactive exposure, the higher your chances of actually getting a disease or getting cancer. And obviously this is like in smoking, very dependent on your own genetic background, on your own immune system. So obviously someone who has a very good immune system, who is rather good at repairing cell defects from radiation or other toxins, will have a lower chance of actually catching cancer, for example, after being exposed to radiation. So there's people out there for example, people with immune defects, people who take medication that reduces their immune functions, and children whose immune systems aren't fully developed yet, who have a much higher vulnerability towards radioactive effects. And this is not taken into consideration, especially the unborn child, which is the most vulnerable to radioactivity. We know that from research that goes back into the 1950s. An adult can very well take an x-ray of the chest without developing cancer afterwards. But we know that an unborn child in a, in a woman's womb is so vulnerable to radioactivity or to ionizing radiation that in fact even small amounts of radiation, like from a normal x-ray, can actually increase the chances of a child getting cancer by very substantial degrees. So one single x-ray to the abdomen of a pregnant woman would increase the chance of getting cancer within childhood by 50%. And this is just one x-ray, and we're talking about much higher doses in Fukushima. So by saying that all people are alike and all children are alike and there's no difference between an unborn child or a child of five years old, this radiobiologic knowledge that we've accumulated over several decades is just completely discounted in the UNSCARE report, and they're acting like we wouldn't know that children, and especially unborn children, have a much higher vulnerability. So that's a point that, that I, especially as a pediatrician, feel very strongly about that needs to be corrected. It cannot be that we base all our recommendations regarding radiation dose levels on healthy adults, healthy male adults, instead of actually on the most vulnerable population, which is the unborn child. Here's one of the other points that really struck me in the list of objections that have been voiced by IPPNW against the UNSCIR report, and that is non-cancer diseases and hereditary effects were ignored by UNSCIR. Yes, that's another big problem. Even though we know for many years that radiation, ionizing radiation, causes not just cancer effects, but non-cancer effects as well, such as cardiovascular diseases, glaucoma, psychological and neurological effects, endocrinologic diseases, diseases of the thyroid, for example. We know all of this also from the victims of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but also from um, the liquidators of Chernobyl, uh, the people that were sent in to, to clean up the mess after, after the explosion. And this knowledge is completely ignored by UNSCARE. They act as if there was no scientific evidence for it, even though there's numerous studies that show the 
significant effects of radiation on, for example, cardiovascular diseases or thyroid diseases in people who received low-dose radiation after Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And the same is true for transgenerational effects, genetic effects in future generations that we also see for example, in, in the studies done on animals by Tim Mousseau that I mentioned earlier, but also on, on human populations, where the effects, for example, on children of British nuclear workers lead to increased leukemia rates if their parents were exposed to, to radioactivity. So these are effects that you can't just argue away. Instead of arguing away, they're just being ignored by Unscare. Unskir also did, according to the analysis, misleading comparisons of nuclear fallout with background radiation. So this is what Unscare and other organizations are frequently doing. They're saying, hey, we're just talking about an additional radiation dose of one or two millisieverts per year per person. So this can't really be harmful because natural background radiation is already one or two millisieverts a year. And that's where they're wrong. Obviously, natural background radiation is something that you can't completely avoid. And there's regions in the world where it's higher and there's regions in the world where it's lower. But studies have repeatedly shown that in the regions where it's higher, it's actually causing more cancer. And in the regions where it's lower, people have less cancer. And people who are exposed to more radon gas in, in their homes because they live in an environment that is very rich in radioactive substances in the ground have higher cancer rates. And people who fly a lot, transatlantic flights, and have increased cosmic radiation. They get more cancers. And people who are exposed to higher degrees of terrestrial radiation, they also have a higher cancer rate. Because the correlation between cancer and, or the chance of, of getting cancer and radiation dose is linear. Linear without a threshold. So it goes down to zero. Even small radiation doses lead to a a measurable rise in the chance to develop cancer. And there is no threshold under which you can say everything is safe. And this is the, the story that they're trying to, to sell to people. If it's just one or two millisieverts per year that you're exposed to because of Fukushima fallout, then you don't have anything to worry about. But that's not true. That's like saying to someone, listen, you're just smoking one cigarette a day. That's something that everyone smokes, so you shouldn't worry about it. But people who want to live healthy lives, people who don't want to be exposed to radiation, people who don't want an increased cancer rate, they should have the right to live in an environment that is healthy and that is free of radioactive contamination from, from nuclear fallout. This is something that's man-made. It, it's preventable. And in the regions where it's not preventable anymore because fallout happened, you should give options to the people to move to other places. But this is not happening. This next conclusion, number eight, is, I think, masterful understatement. And that is that the IPPNW says that Unskir's interpretations of the findings are questionable. Yes, what we mean by that is it's not just that they base their calculations on the data and the assumptions, and it's not just the way that they calculate it, but in the end, they draw conclusions. And these conclusions, you could say, okay, now we can calculate how many deaths or how many cancer cases are to be expected. But Ansgar doesn't do that. They don't seriously discuss their findings. So, I mean, we're walking a tight line here. On the one hand, we're criticizing Unscare for systematically underestimating the health effects. On the other hand, we are asking them to at least use the findings that they have and interpret them in a way for people to understand them. It's not very useful to tell people this is the collective dose that the population will be exposed to because people can't really do anything with that number. But if you take this number and you... You actually use the risk factors that, that are publicly available and you calculate what health effects, what number of cancer cases or cancer deaths this leads to, then you can tell people what they actually can expect. And at the same time, we have to say that these expectations or these, these estimations are probably still an underestimation due to the, the factors that we mentioned earlier. Another criticism brought forward is that the protective measures taken by the authorities are misrepresented. Yes, Unscar mentions in its report that radiation exposure to the population would have been much higher if the government hadn't protected the population so well. And while this is obviously true, population could have been exposed to more radiation in, in Japan, 
we feel that it's wrong to cheer the Japanese government for its wonderful uh, cleanup efforts or its wonderful preventive efforts because actually what happened in Fukushima, and this is not our opinion, this was, was written by the Japanese Parliament's investigation committee, was a complete breakdown of the measures that should actually have protected the population. There was complete and utter chaos. People did not know what they were doing. There were no plans in the drawer. The prime minister was completely taken by surprise. He didn't know that Japan had, for example, a radiation tracking system in place that could have let people know where radiation was actually traveling to. Instead, people were evacuated from areas of low radiation to areas of high radiation because no one in the upper echelons knew that this the system existed. We all know that stable iodine tablets can prevent radioactive iodine from a nuclear catastrophe from traveling to the thyroid and causing thyroid cancer. But in Japan, these stable iodine tablets were not distributed to the population in order to prevent a mass panic. So there were a lot of issues concerning the immediate uh, response to the catastrophe, concerning the evacuations, the extent of the evacuations, the cleanup efforts, where it's not very useful to actually say that uh, everything went perfectly and otherwise the catastrophe would, would have been much bigger. We feel that it's just fitting at this point to join the Japanese Parliament's investigation commission in their criticism of, of how badly actually the first response was and what could have been done better. Because, I mean, we're dealing with a problem that could happen any day again in Japan with more than 50 nuclear sites and an earthquake-prone region. So this is not something that happened once and will never happen again. We know from Chernobyl, we know from Fukushima, from Harrisburg, that it could happen any time and in every country. So in order to improve the safety plans and the public safety for the population, it's not very useful to just say this time everything went well because it didn't. And obviously it could have been much worse. Yes, Japan was very lucky, so to speak. The people of Japan were very lucky that the wind was blowing eastwards and blew more than 80% of the radiation out to the sea. If the wind had blown south, even just for one day, the metropolis of Tokyo would have been subjected to radioactive fallout. And this is something that we don't want to imagine what that would have caused. But in effect, there was just one day of wind going northwest, which now is causing most of the problems that we're seeing in the, in the heavily affected um, cities and communities. Just from one day of radioactive fallout, all the other days, the Japanese were lucky enough that the wind blew east. So, yes, it's some way you can say that um, this catastrophe could have been much, much worse. The last point made is that conclusions from collective dose estimates were not represented. Yeah. Um, like I said before, the UNSCARE report mentioned the collective dose estimates, so it said how many person sieverts uh, the Japanese population will be exposed to in the coming decades, but they failed to actually say what this would mean for the people. To give an example, we tried to add this estimation. Just to give an example of how we did that, Unscare says that there will be a total collective dose of 48,000 person sieverts. So the total collective dose is the sum of all the individual doses of every person in Japan that is exposed to radioactivity due to Fukushima over their lifetime. This is the total collective dose, so 48,000 person sieverts. And if you take the risk factors that are internationally accepted, then this would lead to between four and 16,000 excess cases of cancer in Japan. Again, based on the underestimations that I just explained. So the number would probably be much higher if you actually took the right data and the right assumptions. But this is if you just take the numbers that Anske represents and calculates, you are dealing with four to 16,000 additional cases of cancer and two to 9,000 of these fatal. So you have 16,000 people who would develop cancer due to Fukushima who would otherwise not have developed cancer 
You have a lot of them who survive after chemotherapy operations or radiation therapy, but you have 9,000 or a little bit more than 9,000 people who will die because of cancers related to the Fukushima nuclear accident. And this is something you have to tell the people. This is something that you have to admit and say, listen, this was a huge catastrophe and this is what this will lead to. And what we can do is try to reduce this number by really having strict controls of radioactive contamination in the food, moving people, especially young families and children, away from the radioactively contaminated regions, giving them all the support that we can in order to get them out of the contaminated areas and to give them health care and health checks as would be appropriate in order to localize cancers and other diseases early and in order to treat them better. But only very little is happening in this regard. People are actually encouraged to move back to the radioactively contaminated regions because of economic factors. They don't want uh, these regions to become empty. They want to forget this ever happened. They want people to move on. And they don't want to admit that this will have health effects in the coming decades. They don't want to uh, admit that people will be suffering from it. And with they, I mean the Japanese nuclear village, the politicians behind nuclear energy, the companies behind nuclear energy, the state control organizations which are receiving money from the nuclear industry, all of them are trying to whitewash this, this catastrophe. And UNSCARE is part of this movement. UNSCARE is, is helping them. And this is something that we cannot accept as, as scientists and as doctors, that a UN body is actually whitewashing this catastrophe. This is a damning analysis of UNSCARE and their report. In your estimation, is UNSCARE operating out of a difference of opinion and alternative interpretation of the data that they are using? Or is there an element of outright lying and propaganda on the part of UNSCARE to protect the nuclear industry? I think that's a very difficult issue to tackle. You have to see that UNSCARE is a UN body. And as a UN body, the states that are members of the UN are sending delegates or are sending representatives to this body. So the question is, which states are sending representatives? It's the nuclear states. It's the United States, it's Canada, it's Germany, it's Japan, it's uh, India. It's the countries that have nuclear power, that have the capacity to have nuclear programs. And obviously, these countries have a vested interest in keeping this nuclear power, this nuclear capacity. So they're sending scientists which are coming straight out of their nuclear programs, scientists that have grown up in these nuclear programs, that have made a career in the International Atomic Energy Agency, that have been working for nuclear fuel companies. So these are not people that you would say are critical of nuclear energy. No scientists that has ever published a critical paper on nuclear energy or health effects of ionizing radiation will ever be allowed in UNSCARE. UNSCARE is a club of scientists representing the interests of the nuclear states. And this is something that people have to be aware of. It's not an independent body of research. It's not a body that is composed of critical scientists on the one hand and pro-nuclear scientists on the other hand. It's strictly pro-nuclear. And there's people sitting, sitting on UNSCARE and there's scientists that are being quoted in their paper who have been working their entire lives for the nuclear industry in their countries. So I wouldn't go so far to say that they are lying. They are doing propaganda, but they have a group thing. They're coming from organizations that are very pro-nuclear. They've never heard anything different. They have a certain bias that they just can't get away from. And what's necessary in science, in true science, is that you have different opinions and scientists from different fields arguing with each other and actually testing their hypothesis and testing their opinions against each other so that in the end, what comes out is as close to the truth as possible. But UNSCARE is not the right body to do that. UNSCARE does not allow criticism, does not allow a neutral position. And so while I wouldn't say that UNSCARE deliberately lies or uses propaganda, I have to say that its views and its papers show very clearly who's paying the bill and very clearly where these people are coming from. How has the IPPNW critical analysis been received, meaning by the media? Has there been any kind of governmental response to it? And has it been acknowledged and responded to by UNSCARE? That's a very interesting question. We were in contact with UNSCARE before publishing our paper, and we actually 
Ansgar published a sort of executive summary, a sort of teaser or a, a preview on their full report at the UN General Assembly last October. And when we read this preview, we immediately responded to Ansgar and told them, well, listen, reading through your paper, your executive summary, these are the points, these are the issues that we have problems with, these are the points that we see critically, and do you want to have a dialogue with us? What they did was they actually took a lot of our arguments, and we find now in the final paper, in the final version, some of our wording, some of our arguments, but the conclusions, they stay the same. So... In our first uh, first letter to Ansgar, we criticized them for sitting in their ivory tower and passing judgment on people far away in other countries without actually looking at their individual suffering and their individual situations and just saying, don't worry, everything will be fine. But they don't travel to Fukushima and talk to the people up there and, and ask them how they are feeling. And so in their final paper, what they say is the same conclusion, everything will be fine. But they add the sentence that obviously it's very important to uh, realize that people are suffering and to uh, pay close attention to the individual stories of the people on the ground. So we see that in a way they've responded and taken up some of our criticism, but nothing has changed regarding their conclusions. And this is something that we don't expect in any case. I mean, we don't expect to make a big dent on this organization of Unscare because obviously they come from backgrounds that don't allow for critical thinking or for critical points regarding nuclear energy. <laughs> That's not how they make their money. That's not why they are sitting in this, in this position and being flown across the world in this UN body. It's because they are saying what the governments want them to say. Regarding the reception that our paper got by the media, there were two large press conferences, one in New York City in front of the UN together with Human Rights Now and one in Berlin. Both were pretty well um, visited. We had some TV appearances, we had some newspaper articles and radio articles or radio stories regarding our findings. Overall, it's a very scientific and very specific topic and doesn't really go down well in, in mainstream media. But that wasn't our intention. I think our intention was that this UNSCA report will be cited and will be referred to for years to come. People will always say, well, in the UNSCA reports, it says this and that. And our point was just that we want to give people an alternative view. We want to say, well, it might say so in the UNSCA report, but read our criticism and then question if what it says in the UNSCA report is really the truth. We don't think that we have the truth in our hands either. We are much too small and much too limited in our resources to be able to do giant research on hundreds and thousands of people in Japan in order to find out what's, what's actually happening with them. But what we can do as scientists and as, as doctors and as human beings is to ask critical questions and to ask, is this really believable? Is this really the truth? And I think the journalists that caught this line, who saw that as we are just doctors trying to protect our patients, trying to stand up to an industrial lobby which is causing harm to public health, promoting a world that is healthy and free of nuclear contamination. I think these journalists, they got it right and they were able to spread our message. And we hope that in the coming years and decades, when people look at the UNSCA report, they will also find our report and have maybe a more critical or unbiased view of UNSCA's findings. What can we do to help bring this important analysis to international attention? Well, what we're trying to do now is to actually get this criticism to the different UN delegations, which will be reviewing UNSCARE's report at the upcoming General Assembly meeting in October. What every individual blogger, journalist, everyone who's in the topic can do is actually spread this uh, this information and say, well, here's the UNSCAR report. You can read it and you can find a lot of information in it. And here's a critical analysis of the UNSCAR report, which you can use in addition in order to better understand where the limitations and the problems of the UNSCAR report actually lie. If someone is able to make this information more widely known, for example, through news outlets like your own show or uh, through blogs or Wikipedia articles. I think it's just important for this information to reach people. 
This might be a student doing research for his, his class project. This might be a teacher doing research for what he's going to teach his students. This might be politicians or their aides looking for information in order to shape policies. This might be journalists doing a background research or just the general public, people who have a nuclear power plant in their close proximity and want to find out what happened in Fukushima. All of these people would profit from an unbiased, from a scientific approach to the unscare report that is not dainted by industrial interests, the interests of a lobby group, a very powerful lobby group, annotated by, by doctors and scientists with the aim of actually getting a clearer picture of the health effects of ionizing radiation as a result of Fukushima fallout. That was Dr. Alex Rosen, a German pediatrician who is vice president of International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War. He joined us from his home in Berlin, Germany. A transcript of this interview is available in both English and German on the website nuclearhotseat.com under this episode, number 245. The critical analysis Dr. Rosen cited that was created by the IPPNW is available in English, German, and Japanese translations. All will be linked on the website. Activist shout out! Hey, all you rad waste specialists, what's happening in Nebraska? A nuclear hot seat listener wrote to tell me on February 19, 20, and 21, on Interstate 80 in Nebraska between Lincoln and Grand Island, I saw at least seven nuclear transports of all kinds, from a standard Connex metal shipping container to a single cask on a flatbed trailer to a really scary flatbed with eight three-foot square by four-foot tall black metal boxes with the tops painted yellow. Each shipment had radiation placards on them. That's a lot of waste being moved in a short time. The shipments were mostly headed west, but one was heading east. Is something going on that we don't know about? Well, given that this is nuclear, the answer is probably yes. Something is always going on that we don't know about, but that's not very specific. So if anyone listening to this knows anything that could help us decode this cross-Nebraska transit of nuclear materials, send an email to me at info at nuclearhotseat.com. We'll carry the updated information on a future show. Here's today's final thought. I'm still processing what I learned last week in North St. Louis, where I went to cover the Adams Next Door Symposium for Nuclear Hot Seat, and meet with the Just Moms. This was a life-changing experience. It's one thing for me to talk about being exposed to the radiation at Three Mile Island, but that was almost 37 years ago. Or to talk about Fukushima, which is dangerous, but still, it's on the other side of an ocean, and sometimes it doesn't feel that immediate. It's quite another thing to be with people who are dealing with radiation issues every day, up close and personal. People who have radioactive hot spots in their backyards and a diagnosis of stage 4 lung cancer when they never smoked a day in their lives, whose kids are sick, whose friends and family have died, whose equity in their homes is now zero, and who are trapped living next to a radioactive nightmare. There's really nothing one can say in the face of such calamity to the people who are living through it. Words genuinely fail me. In a way, it's like North St. Louis got hit with the third bomb of World War II. No fireball, no instantaneous mass destruction of property, just radiation, stealthy, invisible radiation. Now 70-plus years of creeping radioactive contamination that has been poisoning their lives from the inside out. This is the revelation of nuclear's dirty little secret, that it produces toxic radioactive waste that they have no appropriate way or will to handle, treat, or store responsibly, 
that has been allowed to infiltrate our lives and cause our deaths. The nuclear industry's only protection from massive rage-induced reprisal by we the people is that it takes years, decades, for the destruction caused by their dirty little secret to show up, and longer than that for it to be recognized as sourcing back to them, if ever it is. Well, here it is. Seven decades of exposure to radiation, and you get the outrageous cancer cluster discovered by Just Mom's STL, and those working with Coldwater Creek Just the Facts, please, both of them sites on Facebook. This community has been exposed to radioactive nuclear weapons waste longer than any other community in the world. So what happens in North St. Louis is a preview for all of those other communities and individuals who have been exposed to the radioactivity that is nuclear's dirty little secret. This is Fukushima in 65 years, or perhaps sooner. Chernobyl in 40. Any waste dump or uranium mining site or weapons manufacturing site for however long it's been there, plus the number of years it takes to 70. This is their future. This is all of our futures being revealed. The nukesters still think they can get away with it. Well, they can't. They won't. Those of us who are aware are growing in number, knowledge, and strength. And this industry will be forced by rising tides of humanity to stop making more radioactive waste and figure out how to clean up the mess that they've already made, no matter the cost. Meanwhile, those in the nuclear industry who think that they're immune to the consequences of their actions just might learn the hard way from North St. Louis that they're not. After all, they can and do get cancer, too. Only they are not the innocent victims. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, March 1, 2016. Material for this week's program has been researched and compiled from enenews.com, courier-journal.com, hillaryclinton.com, ecowatch.com, nwpr.org, news.co.au, whowhatwhy.org, tri-cityherald.com, nhk.or.jp, japantoday.com, fukushima-diary.com, and our friend Iori Mochizuki, and formable.com, and our friend the esteemed Lucas Hickson, asahi.com, radiation.org, nuclear-news.net, TEPCO, TheGuardian.com, UK.Reuters.com, ChinaPost.com, World Nuclear Association, the zombie apocalypse supporting drones who trade their birthright for a mess of pottage by writing for World Nuclear News, and the gold standard of activists who gather on the Nuclear Hot Seat site on Facebook, which you are all invited to visit and to like. Theme music written by me, sung by Marilee Weber, accompaniment by John Barnard, and recorded at Winslow Court Studio in Hollywood. Nuclear Hot Seat is syndicated by UCY.TV, on StuWebRadioNetwork.com, in New Zealand by NewZSentinel.com, and ActivateMedia.org. We're always looking for other networks to connect with, so if you know a news aggregator or community radio station, a little broadcast station that's local, that would like to carry the show, please put us in touch. Check out the archive of over 240 shows on the website, NuclearHotSeat.com, on our YouTube channel under Nuclear Hot Seat Videos, and on iTunes. And a reminder... It's your contributions that help keep Nuclear Hot Seat the vital force for honest, accurate nuclear news that it is. So please, do what you can this week to help us out with a donation at NuclearHotSeat.com. Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues. So if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at NuclearHotSeat.com. We are copyright 2016, Lee B. Halevi and Hardestry Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed as long as proper attribution is provided. This is Lee B. Halevi of Hardestry Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, reminding you that we have all had our nuclear wake-up call. Now, don't go back to sleep, 
because we are all in the nuclear hot seat. Nuclear hot seat. What are those people thinking? Nuclear hot seat. What have those boys been drinking? Nuclear hot seat. The corium is sinking. Our time to act is shrinking, but our activists are linking. Nuclear hot seat. It's the bomb.